Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Charlie Neymar, and I'm the Director in Chief of Marine Corps History at uh, Quantico, Virginia. And uh, welcome to uh, the uh, OSD uh, uh, speaker series, where we're going to have a really exciting afternoon about uh, the uh, advisors in the Vietnam War. Uh, before we get started, I have one little bit of housekeeping uh, we have to do. Uh, I was told by the security folks that if you have a uh, security badge, please remove it and uh, have it not visible. Uh, and then, uh, other than that, that's the only thing we have to cover, and then we're going to go ahead and get right into our program. Uh, the speakers tonight, or this afternoon rather, are going to be Dr. Andy Bertle, General Tony Zinni, and Dr. Jim Wilbanks. Now, I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, Dr. Bertle is the uh, Chief of uh, Military Operations Branch at the Army History or Center for Military History. He's the author of the U.S. Army Counterinsurgency and Contingency Operations Doctrine, 1860 to 1941, and a companion volume covering the period 1942 to 1976. And he is currently writing the Army's official history of its advisory program in Vietnam, covering 1961 to 1965. Uh, next speaker, General Zinni, almost uh, really doesn't need an introduction. Most people know his, his background. 35 years of service in the Marine Corps, including two tours in Vietnam as a company commander and as an advisor to the, Marine, to the Vietnamese Marine Corps Battalion. Among his many overseas deployments, he was Deputy Commanding General of the Kurdish Relief Effort in 1991, Director of Operations for Unified Task Force Somalia in 1992-1993, and Commander of the Combined Task Force Protecting the UN Withdrawal from Somalia in 1995. His last active duty billet was Commander-in-Chief U.S. Central Command during 1997-2000. Dr. Jim Wilbanks retired from the Army as a Lieutenant Colonel with 23 years service as an infantry officer in various assignments to include a tour as an advisor with the South Vietnamese Infantry Regiment during the 1972 North Vietnamese Easter Offensive. He is currently on the, uh, uh, the General of uh, the Army, he is, were, uh, excuse me, he is currently on the uh, faculty at the U.S. Army uh, Command and General Staff College since 1992 where he is currently the General of the Army George C. Marshall Chair of Military History and the Director of the Department of the Army History Program. He, is, he has published works include Abandoning uh, Vietnam, the Battle of An Lac, and the Tet Offensive, A Concise History. Dr. Bertle will open the program with a brief overview of the U.S. advisory effort in Vietnam. Then General Zinni and Dr. Wilbanks will then talk about their experiences as advisors in Vietnam and any conclusions they drew from that experience about the overall advisory effort and their observations that might be relevant to the recent effort in Iraq and the current effort in Afghanistan. There will be 30 minutes available for questions and discussion with the audience. Again, thank you very much, and we'll start off with uh, Dr. Bertle. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Several years ago, when the Army was cranking up its advisory effort in Iraq, the Center of Military History briefed the Army Chief of Staff on the advisory program in Vietnam. After hearing about some of the problems that had been experienced in Vietnam, the Chief stated that he was confident that these problems would not resurface in Iraq because today's soldiers were, quote, smarter and better than those who had served in Vietnam. Well, I don't know if today's soldiers are smarter or better than soldiers past, but I do know that in both conflicts, the advisory mission was critical to our overall war effort and that they did not always go smoothly. Indeed, advising is a difficult job. General Collins once likened the advisory duty to, quote, trying to push not pull a string of wet spaghetti across a table. Perhaps the most common emotion advisors experienced in Vietnam was the frustration of being held responsible for something they could not control, a feeling captured in a wartime ditty called the advisor's lament. I can't pull the throttle, I can't ring the bell, but if this goddamn train should stop, I'm the one who catches hell. Nothing was more frustrating than the feeling that one's efforts were falling on fallow ground. As one advisor put it, I instructed, they smiled, nodded, and often ignored what I said. That comment was made by a young captain who was a battalion advisor in 1963 by the name of Colin Powell. Today, I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of the advisory system in Vietnam. Although all services participated, I'm going to confine my comments to the Army, which is by far the largest component. U.S. military advisors first arrived in Vietnam in 1950, when the country was French, part of French Indochina, and the French were battling for control of that territory 
with Vietnamese communists and nationalists. The initial advisory effort was very small, consisting of just a few dozen individuals, and it was focused on the programmatic aspects of military assistance. It did no training, and it gave no advice, as the French wanted only our money and materiel, not our thoughts. After France's defeat in 1954 and the bifurcation of Vietnam into North and South as independent states, the U.S. established a new military assistance group. Our presence now extended to training centers, divisions, and corps. In 1959, it was extended down to the regimental level as we helped the new country build an armed forces virtually from scratch. By 1960, the U.S. advisory mission had grown to over 600 people when a renewed communist insurgency threatened the country. John F. Kennedy, who had become president in 1961, greatly expanded our presence. The most important step occurred in 1962 when U.S. began placing advisors down to the battalion level and to the province and also added several hundred intelligence advisors. In 1964, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, or MACV, extended the advisory system down to the district level, the equivalent of a county in the United States. By the time U.S. combat troops arrived in Vietnam in 1965, the advisory system was well established and would not fundamentally change for the rest of the war. There would be some modifications, of course, and the numbers of advisors would grow, both reflecting the growing size of the South Vietnamese military, as well as a growing tendency to insert Americans into more facets of the war. The presence of U.S. units after 1965 meant that these units could also provide limited assistance to their South Vietnamese counterparts through a variety of buddy systems. These varied considerably from having units collaborate in planning and executing uh, combined operations to intermingling combat units at times even down to the squad level. Most were informal and often temporary arrangements and the individuals involved did not count towards the advisory numbers. In 1967, MACV assumed responsibility for many of America's civil assistance and pacification related programs with the creation within MACV of the Office of Civil Operations and Revolutionary Development Support, commonly known as CORDS. By this point, the number of advisory personnel assigned to assist regular military formations and those assigned to assist paramilitary form formations and civilian functions was split about 50-50. Also in 1967, MACV began to employ several hundred mobile training teams, each consisting of about four to seven men, that would provide additional, though transitory, assistance to areas of the Vietnamese force structure that were judged particularly weak, most notably paramilitary and logistics units. In 1969, MACV redesignated re all advisory teams as combat assistance teams, or CATs and redefine their mission from advising to combat support coordination. This reflect a growing maturity of the South Vietnamese military, as well as the fact that advisory detachments increasingly spent most of their time coordinating the application of U.S. artillery and air support for South Vietnamese units, rather than providing advice to Vietnamese authors, officers who either did not need or who did not want to receive advice. Under CATS, the size of battalion and regiment teams remained unchanged, but division and corps teams declined sharply in strength. The cuts reflected America's new policy of gradually withdrawing from the war. In 1969, the advisory system reached its peak authorized strength of about 16,000, with 13,500 of these slots reserved for Army personnel. These numbers, uh, these men advised the Vietnamese military of about 1.1 million men. Thereafter, advisors 
numbers diminished slowly as the MACV commander, General Creighton Abrams, tried to shield the advisory effort from cuts as long as possible. The transition did not always go smoothly. Sometimes advisors had to be transferred from quiet sectors to more active ones because there weren't enough people to go around. Also, when the South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese received uh, large shipments of new equipment or suffered serious losses, special teams had to be formed to help them adjust. In 1971, MACV withdrew all advisors below the regimental level with the exception of those assigned to Marine and Airborne units. The following year, the U.S. withdrew all mobile training assistance teams, leaving about 6,000 advisors, which was the strength of the advisory establishment in 1965 when U.S. combat units first came in. Interestingly, General Abrams and the Joint Chiefs of Staff did not believe the South Vietnamese military would be able to stand alone. They wanted to maintain an advisory and support staff of 15,000 indefinitely after the withdrawal of U.S. combat troops, and they believed the Nixon administration had accepted this principle. They were stunned when in January 1973, the United States signed the Paris Peace Accords that included not just the withdrawal of American combat troops, but the removal of all advisors as well. The last advisor left Vietnam in March of 1973. So that's a quick chronology of our 22-year advisory effort in Vietnam. Uh, now let's look at some of the specifics of the program. First, how were advisors selected? General selection criteria require that potential advisors demonstrate first professional competence in their MOS. Second, they had to have completed at least two years of college and graduated from a service school commensurate with their rank. In other words, uh, senior officers had to have graduated from the war college, field grade from the command and general staff college, and branch advanced course graduation was required for company grade officers. Potential advisors had to be physically fit to demonstrate some aptitude at learning foreign languages and a general adaptability to foreign customs and people. They had to have proven ability as instructors. And finally, they had to have had attended a counterinsurgency related training course. Officers were ineligible if they were on their last tour, had a blemished record, or had been passed over for promotion. Another group rarely tapped for advisory duty was reservists and National Guardsmen. This was due to the fact that the President did not mobilize uh, the reserves during the war. For a variety of reasons, it was often not possible to find and to send to Vietnam individuals who met all of the criteria. One senior officer stated in 1967 that roughly 25 percent of serving advisors would have been rejected for advisory duty had the selection criteria been strictly applied. The Army reserved its most specialized selection and preparation efforts for province senior advisors. MACV considered province senior advisors to be the linchpins of the counterinsurgency effort as they served as the point where military, paramilitary, police, intelligence, and civil affairs programs converged for application at the local level. As a result, in 1967, the Army initiated a special province senior advisor program. The selection criteria for these individuals was the same as for other advisors with some addition. First, they had to be lieutenant colonels prior to November 1968 or full colonels thereafter. They had to be commissioned in one of the combat arms. They had to have been a successful battalion commander, had been a veteran of combat, and have already served one tour of duty in Vietnam. They had to demonstrate a familiarity with the Vietnamese language, and last, they had to volunteer for the assignment. Once the Army had identified candidates, the Chief of Staff of the Army 
personally wrote to each nominee requesting that he volunteer to become a province senior advisor. To sweeten the pot, additional incentives were given. First, the Army provided family quarters at a post of the advisor's choice, either in the United States, Philippines, Hawaii, Guam, or Okinawa. He was given two weeks of additional family leave in Hawaii, with the Army paying family travel expenses to Hawaii, as well as additional per diem. All province senior advisors were evaluated on their efficiency reports by general officers. They were promised they would have a substantial voice in choosing their next assignment after serving in Vietnam. And finally, the Army reiterated a promise that it had already given to most advisors uh, several years earlier that advisory duty would count for command credit when it came to their evaluating their, their careers. It should be noted that province senior advisors were a very select group. There were never more than 44 of them at a time. The small number made the special program possible. Even so, they faced difficulties. Roughly 60% of those who received invitational letters from the chief of staff to join the program refused to accept the assignment. Having selected advisory personnel, let's take a look at how these people were trained. In 1962, the Army created a special training course for Vietnam advisors called the Military Assistance Training Advisor Course, or MATA. MATA initially lasted four weeks, but soon expanded to six weeks. It covered counterinsurgency theory, tactics and techniques, field craft, psyops, civic action, country and language skills. Over time, there was a tendency to move towards specialization. In addition to offering special courses for intelligence and civil affairs advisors, the Army eventually split the MATA course into four separate courses for division and corps, province and battalion, psyops, and senior NCO advisors. Given their special importance, the Army in 1967 created a 33-week course for province senior advisors. In 1969, district senior advisors began receiving a special 11-week course, and additional training was available inside Vietnam itself, particularly for paramilitary advisors. However, just as it was not always possible to obtain personnel that met all the qualification criteria, the demands of the moment often did not permit everyone to receive the required training. Indeed, it was not unusual for some advisors to show up in Vietnam without any special training at all, especially during the early years of the advisory effort. One of the thornier questions was determining how much language training advisors would need. The MATA course initially contained 40 hours of Vietnamese, but this was soon expanded to 120 hours. In addition, the Army directed that advisors destined for certain positions receive language training at the Defense Language Institute. This training could vary from a few weeks to, in rare cases, an entire year. Most advisors attending the Defense Language Institute received six to 12 weeks of language instruction. By 1969, about half of all division and corps advisors and 75% of all battalion and province advisors had received language instruction at the Defense Language Institute. However, Americans found Vietnamese to be a difficult, difficult language to learn, and even those with extended courses found the instruction to be of limited value. Once trained and selected, the advisors traveled to Vietnam. In the early years, advisory tours varied from one to two years in length, depending upon one's job and whether or not dependents accompanied the soldier to Vietnam. By 1962, all advisory tours were standardized at 12 months, and in 1965, all dependents were evacuated from Vietnam. In some cases, advisors rotated between field and headquarters assignments uh, on a six-month basis. This was partially due to the fact that it, 
advisory duty was deemed to be unhealthy. In fact, it was not unusual for a field advisor to lose 20, 30, or more pounds during the time he was in the field. Beginning in the late 1960s, province senior advisors were required to serve 18 months in country. The organization of the advisory effort varied over time, but the general tendency was for it to grow in size. For example, core advisory teams numbered five men in 1960, but by 1965, each corps had over 140 advisors. Division advisory teams likewise grew from six men each in 1960 to 52 men each in 65. Many of the additional personnel, however, while labeled advisors, were administrative staff who in fact did no advising. Due both to manpower constraints and a desire not to overwhelm the Vietnamese, MACV kept battalion advisory teams quite small. From the time they were created in 1962 until 1964, battalion teams consisted of just three men, a captain, a lieutenant, and an E6 light weapons specialist. In 1965, the standard battalion team expanded to five men, the captain, a lieutenant, now two light weapons specialists, and a radio operator. This will remain true for the remainder of the war. Generally speaking, the U.S. maintained between two and 12 advisors at Vietnamese schools and training centers. As for the provinces, a typical province advisory team numbered four men in 1960, two, but by 1965, it was over 20, not counting the five additional district advisors that were in each district that composed a province, and usually a province had four to six districts. So that's the advisory program in a nutshell. What was the advisory experience like? For that, I will turn the podium over to my distinguished colleagues. The uh, Vietnamese uh, Marine Corps, which I want to describe first because it was the organization I advised, and the U.S. Marine approach to it, adv advising was uh, somewhat different than, than what you've just heard in, in, on the Army side, uh, but still some of the things were